It's America's pastime, with a pronounced emphasis on past. In recent years, baseball has struggled to maintain its relevance in its nation of origin, going up against the likes of the NFL, the country's most watched sport, and the NBA and MLS, which have a grip on America's coveted youth market, not to mention the somewhat regional but ever-growing National Hockey League. The coronavirus pandemic certainly hasn't done any favors for Major League Baseball either, as players and owners continue to struggle to come to terms on resuming play while some other sports leagues are actually already back in action. But while the sport is seemingly losing its momentum in the United States, it's surging in Caribbean nations like the Dominican Republic, Cuba, and Venezuela, as well as the Asia-Pacific, with Japan and Korea both experiencing increased interest in the game as evidenced by the soaring support for their professional leagues. Of course, in Europe, soccer is king, but not only is baseball lagging behind, the sport has gone almost completely unacknowledged throughout the EU. But there is one nation which, because of its constituent countries in the West Indies, has a vested interest in the game. There's a latent enthusiasm waiting to be awoken, perhaps by the success of its individual players in the MLB, or by some great Olympic victory. Securing that elusive gold medal in Tokyo may just be what catapults baseball into the tier of most popular sports in the kingdom of the Netherlands. Please remember to replace the speaker on the post when you leave the theater. Show starts in one minute. Welcome and thank you for tuning in for episode two of Growing the Game, where each week I will talk to a new guest about the development of a particular sport in a particular country. This week we're going to focus on the growth of baseball in the Kingdom of the Netherlands, which includes the island nations of Aruba, Curaçao, and St. Martin. I am absolutely fascinated by this topic. Uh, because I can't think of any other country in the world in a remotely similar situation as the Netherlands, where you have a sport that's generally ignored by 98% of the country, but in its constituent countries halfway across the world, the sport is played constantly and at a tremendously high level. And the countries come together as one nation to compete in international events. And not just compete, but thrive. The Netherlands won the Baseball World Cup in 2011, it's won the European Championship 23 times, including last year. And the roster is absolutely loaded with talent, including MLB All-Star Xander Bogarts, Angelton Simmons, Jonathan Scope, Kenley Jansen, and not to mention D.D. Gregorius and Jerickson Profar. So, completely stacked. But do those stars and that international success, does that all translate into fan support in the Netherlands? And what's being done to continue to develop the game in a nation that's infinitely more concerned with soccer? Well, I landed the best possible person to answer these questions. His name is Seb Visser, and he is a former baseball player in the top Dutch league, and now works in marketing and PR for the Royal Netherlands Baseball and Softball Federation, which is the national governing body for the sport. So I am so excited to bring him on. Seb, thanks for joining me. Yeah, no problem. So I, I want to start off with a little bit of your background. So uh, can you tell me about where you grew up? Uh, I was born and raised in Amsterdam, actually. Uh, started playing baseball there when I was three or four years old. Uh, actually made it to the highest level in the Netherlands, the, the, the top league. Uh, it's called Hofklasse. Um, and I played there up until last year. And I decided to play one lower level because uh, it, takes a lot, it takes up a lot of time. Uh, we play, uh, it's not like every day in the States, but we play on Thursday nights, Saturday and uh, Sunday afternoons. And I have a full-time job at the, the Dutch Baseball and Softball Federation, so it, it took up so much time that I didn't have any time for my girlfriend or anything or like right. family. Yeah, yeah. Uh, decided to take it uh, down a notch a little bit. Yeah, unfortunately, but yeah, it's uh, what you have to do. At some point, you have to choose for a job. Yeah. So t tell me about your role with the federation. So I do marketing and communication for the for baseball and softball. And then I'm uh, the press officer for the uh, the national baseball and softball team as well. Mm -hmm. And and so what's like what's a day in the life like at your job? 
really depends. <laughs> right now, it's pretty quiet because of Corona. Of course, mm-hmm. we uh, yeah, we're struggling with that here too. Um, there's no season right now, so what we're trying to do is keep everyone posted on what we're doing, uh, how we're trying to work together with other sports federations here in the Netherlands to get sports back as soon as possible. Mm-hmm. Because right now, uh, there's not going to be any sports as uh, up until September 1st. That's what our okay. government has decided so far. The numbers are looking good here, though. Uh, less than 10 people are uh, have to go into the hospital with the corona right now mm-hmm. each day. So we're hoping it trends downwards, and then we can uh, come back to the fields a little bit earlier. Right now, we just we can we can have practice. Mm-hmm. You can play a little inter squad, but uh, you want to play real games and get right. the season going for for as long as we can here because the weather is not going to allow us to do it too long. Right. Well, that's really what we're doing now is keeping everyone informed on what we're doing and trying to get them to the field as fast as we can. Absolutely. How critical of a role does sport play in Dutch culture as a whole? Ooh, it's a tough question. Um, well, for me to answer that, I, I should probably explain a little bit because we have a very different system. Okay. Uh, like you guys, you uh, you play Little League and then you go uh, high school, college, and after that you go pro or, you know, bust pretty much, right? Right. Yeah. What we have here is we have club teams. So we have, we have, uh, clubs, let's call them that. And they start at age uh, three or four, play, uh, used to play peanut balls, what we call it, it's just T-ball. Mm-hmm. Um, we got a new version of that called B-ball, which is, uh, you know, you use, uh, two bases. Uh, there's, there's uh, smaller teams and it's easier to get smaller teams together, but you play there until you're, you know, whenever you're done. You, mm-hmm. can, you can stay at the same club or you can move around if you want to go a little up higher. Uh, there's there's a few clubs who play uh, at, our, at our major league level. Uh, if you want to reach that level and you're from a smaller town or a smaller club, you just move to another club. Mm-hmm. And that goes for all sports here. We don't have any school sports, pretty pretty much nothing. We have you know a PE mm-hmm. at school, and you, you you play basketball or you play uh, handball or some softball even if you're lucky and uh, and the weather's good, you play outside. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you want to play real sports, you're always in a club. It's very different from what you guys have. I feel like sports is, is, is a bigger, plays a bigger role in your, your culture. It's like everything evolves around sports when I look at America. Like, right. There's a movie. You're not wrong. Or, you know, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we have that to a certain extent, but here it's mainly soccer. Soccer mm-hmm. is everything. And after that, you have some speed skating, you have uh, maybe a little bit of tennis and field hockey, but anything below that. It's just a small, small sport. You play at a club level. Uh, almost no professional sports, not really here, mm-hmm. unless you're like world class and you compete with the at the Olympics. Then you get like uh, funding from the national sports committee. Mm-hmm. But other than that, it's a lot of amateur sports here, which is um, different. But the other, on the other hand, it's good because you get to play until you're like, you know, until you drop that on the field. <laughs> <laughs> That's really interesting. And you you kind of already hit on some of the things I was going to ask. Like, I was going to see if you could break down the hierarchy of sports. Like, obviously, soccer, football is number one. But um, yeah. what, what's kind of that second, third, fourth slot? And then uh, where does baseball factor in? We look at the size of the federations. It's okay. probably hockey next. Uh, hockey has a lot of members here. Uh, we, we're like world class, both men and women in uh, mm-hmm. hockey. Okay. Probably, well, speed skating is large, and then you see the individual, like, uh, individual sports like running, mm-hmm. which is not something you have to do, but I guess that's, that's all, all over the world. You don't have to do that in a federation or a club or whatever. You just go out and run. Mm-hmm. So it's harder to measure. Um, but if you look at team sports, uh, volleyball is pretty big, I think. Uh, handball is getting bigger because our women, uh, won the world championship the other year. Mm-hmm. But, uh, in general, you see team sports, Especially in clubs, they're they're shrinking because of the you know the the cultural differences and, and trends. You see people sporting individually more and more. Mm-hmm. They just want to control their time a little more, and especially baseball and softball, time consuming. Yeah, and you know people want to do other stuff with their with their time. That's a it's tough for us. We got to battle that, but you see that in every every team sport. So we got to figure out a way to get them. Back to the field. Right. And maybe not in the old fashioned way, maybe not playing a complete, you know, uh, league season or something, but maybe 
know, some tournament style baseball or softball, stuff like that. Slow pitch, we're trying to get people back to the field with slow pitch, like uh -huh. old members who recently quit in the last few years, we're trying to get them back through, I don't know, family tournaments, uh, business tournaments, stuff like that. Right. Well, I guess in your case, when were you first introduced to the game? Like, when did you first encounter baseball? Well, I was actually, I was, like I said, three or four years old. And the uh, funny thing is my grandparents both played. Uh, they actually, I think they even met on the field. Oh, wow. But my parents, both both my parents never played. Okay. My dad was a soccer player. My mom played a little bit of tennis, but never really was into sports that much. Mm -hmm. And then my father had a, a colleague who said, you know what? You're starting to look for a sport for your kid. Bring him to my practice. I, I coach a, a t-ball team, so you know, bring him there. And wow. I mean, I was, I was sold from there on. Interesting. Not that that exact situation can be extrapolated to every other kid, but what would you say is the average way that a kid in the Netherlands gets into baseball? I would have to say family. If your mom or dad plays, you, you go to the field with them, and you, you fall in love with the game, and you start playing there, and I think they kind of push you. That's pretty, <laughs> um, you, you get a... How do, you, how do you call that? Indoctrinated? Or yeah. <laughs> yeah. Similar to America. <laughs> yeah, I guess, you know, it's a family, it's a family sport. The culture is like yeah. here, especially in the club teams, you know? Right. Right. You just become a member of the club your parents are in. That goes, uh, that goes for a lot of sports here. Yeah. Right? Especially uh, a small sport like baseball and softball. And, and with sports like baseball, oftentimes you see uh, difficulties for some families to get involved just because of cost of equipment or, uh, team fees, things like that. Is that a barrier in uh, increasing youth participation in the Netherlands, the cost? Um, yeah, it kind of is because, you know, like you said, you got to get, you know, you got to get a bet, helmet, glove, spikes, whatever you got to get, you know, that's, and then you got to pay the team fee, which is it's a big thing. If you want to be, become a member of a club team, you got to mm -hmm. pay the fee. But then again, that's, that's true for most sports. Other than soccer, really, because right. soccer, well, you know, what do you need? You need, some, you need a pair of shoes. That's it. Yeah. So maybe that's why soccer is that big, and that's actually why the the World Baseball and Softball Federation started Baseball Five. I don't know if you heard about. I have not. It's like a, a a new, more like urban kind of version of the sport. Mm -hmm. You play five on five. That's what it's called, Baseball Five. Okay. And you play like a with like a rubber uh, ball, and that's really all you need. You need mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, we we use meters, so I'm not sure what it is like in feet. Times three, I think. So you like 60 square feet. Let's mm -hmm. put it that way. Mm -hmm. You have a small field. Uh, you play with a rubber ball. You can't hit it out. So you can't hit a home run. Okay. It's a weird for a baseball player, but <laughs> it's a fun game. It's super fast. It's a small field. Uh, uh, you got to get athletic players going. And really all you need is that ball. So that's, uh, that's what they're trying to use and what we've been trying to introduce here as well to kind of work around that, you know, the, the, the cost of getting all the equipment and all you need is a ball like soccer. It's easier to get people to come to the field. So has that caught on uh, recently? Well, we, we really just started it. It's, it's okay. super new. I think the, the World Baseball Federation launched it a year and a half ago, something like that. Mm -hmm. And we're just trying to get uh, you know people to play it through our club teams, but also uh, schools and municipalities all around the, the country here. But it takes time to, to introduce a new sport. Of course. It's, of course. It's, yeah. Yeah. So since since Jerks and Profar and that 2004 Little League World Series championship uh, for Curacao, the Netherlands mm -hmm. national team has reached the semifinals of the World Baseball Classic twice uh, and won the European Baseball Championship five times since then. Um, what role has Curacao played in growing the game in the rest of the Netherlands, if at any at all? Well, it's huge, a huge role uh, in in. You know, our, our performance for sure. And that's why we call our, our national team is, is Team Kingdom of the Netherlands, mm -hmm. which is kind of unique because you know, like we've been talking in, before the introduction, you and me, we were talking about how unique that is. So there's no other, not even in the Netherlands, there's no other sports team that uses that title and uses so many players from our Caribbean uh, countries as well. Right. Uh, so would you say it goes for Curacao, but also for Aruba, where uh, um, Sander Bogarts is from. Mm -hmm. Uh, and now Chadwick Trump's on the 40 man roster at the, uh, San Francisco Giants. Um, and in the past, there have been, there have been multiple major league players from there as well. 
um, and they play a huge role, uh, not only for our performances, but also for the popularity of the sport, because there's a lot of people from Aruba, Curaçao, Bonaire, uh, St. Martin, uh, in the Netherlands, mm -hmm. who also like the sport and uh, who are attracted to, to it because they see their superstars playing for our national team as well. Right. Uh, and they, they'll, they'll find it easier to come to join a club in the, in the Netherlands when they get there as well. Exactly. Yeah. I guess like stemming from the success of the national team uh, and those big name players, um, has there been any political support for investing in baseball in the Netherlands? Like does, does the momentum that the country has built kind of pushed leaders to think like, hey, you know, over the last decade, we've basically become the top baseball country in all of Europe. Uh, let's embrace that and go all out and further developing the game here. Um, it's, it's difficult because, um, we do get funding from our national sports committee, mm -hmm. like, uh, the, our national version, version of the IOC, but that goes to our top level teams, our national teams, mm -hmm. when, they, when they have to play like, like for instance, next year, let's say the world baseball classic still will be played. I'm not sure if there's some rumors about it being canceled, mm -hmm. but we, we have that. We have the Olympic qualifier. We have a European championship. Possibly the, the Olympics, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, some other tournament. I think I'm not sure. There's, I think there's another one. Um, so we need we need funding, and we have such a small federation uh, that they help us with funding mm -hmm. you know, our, to our top programs, uh, talent programs as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but just to grow the game, uh, there's not a lot of money for that for any sports here. Interesting. Not not enough, in my opinion. Yeah, <laughs> because you know it's so important, especially in these times with uh, you know health being kind of an issue, right. overweight stuff like that. Yeah, we need more kids and people in general to play sports. So is that just an issue of priorities, like just you know political priorities? It's like uh, we we don't yeah. view sport as really that important or crucial. To I mean, the they always say they view sports as a as an important thing, but like if there have to be budget cuts. Much like in an organization, when you have budget cuts, most of the time, marketing communication is the first one. To yeah. <laughs> cut, you know what I mean? Like, sports is probably the first one to be cut there. Right. And I, I get that because, you know, you need to invest in health and, I mean, healthcare and stuff like that. That's, that's normal. It's a shame, though. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. You know, and still talking about the national team, um, is there a sense of pride from the casual sports fan in the Netherlands when the the kingdom of the netherlands national baseball team uh has an accomplishment in the world baseball classic or in the olympics um is there like a a sense of pride or is it more like eh, that's just a sport we don't really care about so even if we win gold it's not a big deal as much as it pains, to, pains me to say it but i think there's there's not a lot of people actually who uh think it's a big deal Interesting. Yeah, I mean, the Olympics will be different though. If we're going for an Olympic uh, medal. Mm -hmm. It'll get a lot, a lot of attention. And you know, if we do qualify, there's only six countries there, so there's always a good chance you, you know, if you have a good tournament, you get a, you get a medal. Uh, but the World Baseball Classic, which is kind of even a bigger tournament, baseball-wise, yeah, uh, does not get a lot of traction. Mm -hmm. I mean, our national broadcasters might broadcast it like four years ago. They brought now that's twenty. 13 one. They broadcasted it like on their website, mm -hmm. not even on national television. And then, uh, four years ago, it was Fox, Fox Sports Netherlands. They, they had it on, but it's, you know, it's uh, ATV. So you don't reach everyone. So right. that's, uh, that's difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and that's kind of, kind of stems into the next question. We talked a little bit about Jerks and Profar and, uh, Xander Bogarts and some of those stars, Angelton Simmons. Would you say the press, the media, is doing an adequate job in like highlighting their accomplishments over in the MLB uh, to people in the Netherlands? It's getting better and better, I have to say. I know we 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 try to uh, help them with it by you know writing uh, press releases mm -hmm. and keeping them updated. You know, I've I've been press officer for for like four or five years now. Mm -hmm. uh, to know a lot of the Dutch uh, sports press, which really helps because you know you can, you can push some information their way, and then you see that they pay they're paying more and more attention here. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to see them pay more attention, especially now. Like let's say the the MPB, the the Japanese league, starts playing in nine days, I think. Right. We have two guys there. 
Oh, wow. Rick, Rick Van Den Herk and Vladimir Valentin. Mm -hmm. And that's almost the only sport in the entire world still being played. Yeah. So if they do start, I'd like to see, you know, the, uh, the national television pay attention to that national press. Right. That's what we're trying to focus on, you know, let them know that they're starting uh, June 19th. We got two guys there. They're one. Of, they're in the top team going for their, like, sixth championship in seven years, I mm -hmm. think. So uh, it's a big deal that they're playing there on the highest level, which is, like, the second league in the world. Oh, easily. Yeah, yeah. Can you rank the priorities of uh, the attention that you want to allocate? So, like, the national team, the main professional league in the Netherlands – and just the individual players from the Netherlands mm -hmm. playing in uh, the the Japanese league, in the MLB, etc. Let's see how, uh, how would I prioritize, prioritize it? I'd say you need you need heroes, that's for sure. Yeah. And, and that's the guys playing the top league. So we want we want them to be in the picture. Uh, but we need visibility for our uh, top level league as well. Because, mm -hmm. Like I said, there's not a lot of attention from Dutch press for the for the Dutch uh, baseball league. And that's why we're actually setting up a platform with some partners where we're going to broadcast those those games ourselves. So we're going to have oh, wow. live streams. We're going to have uh, highlights. And we're working on getting like some uh, camera journalists and camera girls sending them to the games and doing different, uh, you know, in interviews or specials or stuff like that. And get some, some real cool content. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've just been seeing like, the national press is not going to do too much with it. We got to create some buzz ourselves. And mm -hmm. hopefully when we do that, they start coming back as well. Um, and what's the third one you said? There were, there were three. Yes. So the national team. Well, the national team is our, 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 our flagship. Right. I mean, that's as a federation, that's our number one. And ideally those, those, those heroes play for our flagship team as well. So that's, that kind of combines it. Right. Uh, but that really only happens once every four years, hopefully. Yeah. Right, in, yeah. In the classic. Um, so then we gotta, yeah, really focus on, and that's why, why I always travel with the, with the team as well to make sure we have content and, right. uh, contact with the press in the Netherlands as well. And yeah. They're playing big tournaments. And you see that when we're playing tournaments like the European Championship and stuff like that, you see press getting more and more attention. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's awesome. Um, yeah, and, and that was another thing I was going to ask is, uh, are the Netherlands, uh, pro baseball league, like, is that are those games televised? No, no. That's why we're trying to make sure that we uh, have all live streaming rights and and, and uh, highlights as well. Interesting. Uh, it's actually it's like we we call it our highest league. It's our Dutch major league, mm -hmm. but it's not a pro league. I mean, guys, like I said, if you're if you're on the national team, you get like a stipend. I can okay. call it uh -huh. uh, from the national uh, sports committee, right? Olympic committee, uh, but. Uh, for other guys like like myself, when I used to play there, you get like a small fee for playing in it, but right. you gotta be happy. You don't even have to pay a team fee or anything. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to build it up a little better, you call it semi-pro, but it's nothing more than an amateur league. Or something. That's interesting. Um, which, uh, which is a big reason why we need the live streaming and uh, the highlights to get some sponsorships going. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because more visibility for for us for the sport, but also for possible partners and, uh, and sponsors. Exactly. Yeah. And, and that's just interesting because I'm thinking about it like you know what if what if USA Baseball was uh, responsible for the streaming or for the broadcasting of the MLB. You know, it's just like to put that in perspective. Crazy. Yeah, it would be insane. That's, what, that's why our sports system is so different. You guys have the MLB who, who owns their own rights. You know? Right. We, we own our rights for the, the the club teams as well, but we own the rights to our own major league. But we also have, you know, like USA Baseball, we have our national team. Super different. Yeah, team. yeah. It's really interesting. And I wonder, like, as unfortunate as it might seem compared to, like, the MLB or something, it does give you guys a little bit more control about being able to control the narrative and tell more stories and do exactly what you want to do to grow the game. Yeah, that's true. Uh, so I just, yeah, I find that interesting. Oh, yeah. So, like, talking a little bit more about the, I guess, we'll call it amateur semi-pro <laughs> league. Um, can you kind of break it down for me a little bit? What's what's the fan support like for those games? 
Well, it, it's not as big as it used to be. When I see footage of the, the 70s, mm -hmm. we'd have thousands of people, uh, you know, lined up along the, the baselines uh, behind the fence. First. Really? But there'd be a lot of people there. Huh. Uh, but the times have changed. Like people, like I said, you know, people want to control what they do with their own time. Mm -hmm. uh, so that means less people start playing team sports that are time consuming, but also less people start actually coming to games. Mm -hmm. Uh, so right now, for big games, we still have a few thousand, like the the Holland series, which are our World Series. Mm -hmm. uh, but most games, like we, uh, if, if we play on a Thursday night at certain teams, there might not be more than fifty people there. Wow. Uh, and then other games, there might be three, four hundred. Yeah. And that depends because some teams play in big stadiums, and others just have the field and, and a few seats. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it really depends. And if it's good weather on a Sunday, it's always better than uh, <laughs> all, all Thursday evening. Right. Yeah, yeah. Do teams charge for admission? Some do, some don't. Okay. So, and then the teams that do maybe charge like two to five, you know, euros or uh -huh. dollars. Right. Yeah. Per yeah. game. That's really interesting about how you you mentioned the '70s being a popular era. So, is there any justification for that? Like why it might have been more popular back then during now, especially considering the momentum the national team has? I think it has something to do as well with because soccer has always been the, the biggest sport. Mm -hmm. But back then, uh, soccer clubs or, or sports clubs really had multiple sports in, uh, within their club. Right. So, for instance, I'm, I'm not sure if you heard of Ajax Amsterdam. Yes. Uh, yeah. They used to have a, a baseball uh, department as well wow so they play uh they played the highest level mm -hmm. and they played there until like the 70s i think uh -huh. and that's when you know uh the baseball season and the soccer season didn't overlap mm -hmm. so you'd have uh, in the winter you play soccer and then in summer the pretty much the only sport would be baseball and people would go there they would just come there there's not much like to support you can go on club. a playstation or, or you know Stuff like that. Right. So there's, there's, yeah, there's just so much more to do now than there was then. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. And even in summer times, there's, there's just more sports. The, 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 the season started to overlap. So that's why you don't see, there, there's almost no, especially not the big soccer teams. They don't have any uh, baseball department. Right. And I was going to ask, like, IX, PSV, like, teams like that. They all had, like, Feyenoord, they all had uh, baseball teams as well. And PSV and, still exists, actually. Who's this? PSV. PSV still, still has a baseball, baseball team. team. But they're not, like, they're still called PSV, but they're not officially the same club, I think. Oh, okay. I was going to say, like, why do you think that some of those teams dropped the baseball? Was it just they weren't getting the support? I think, yeah, I think and it had to do with finance as well. Mm -hmm. And just uh, so soccer started getting more professional. Mm -hmm. And the season started to grow and, and, and uh, elongate. That's what you call it, getting yeah. longer and longer. Going into the summer, mm -hmm. uh, you just see that there, uh, you know, when you turn a professional in, in soccer, you, you don't really get to play like as part of your country. You don't get to play other sports anymore. Mm -hmm. but you'd see less and less guys playing for both teams in the, in the same club. And I guess just fewer and fewer people started playing for those, uh, for those teams. I'm not sure because I didn't live, you know, right. back then. But, yeah. <laughs> I think, it, uh, yeah, it was a financial thing as well. Yeah. As the uh, the soccer team started to get more professional, they just needed the money to pay salary for their soccer guys. Right. I don't know that you'd have or the the federation would have any pull in this, but are there any efforts to try and get some of those big clubs with all the money to maybe try again to reinvest in baseball? Do y'all kind of push for that? Well, we've had some of the ideas about that because you hear more and more how important it is to play especially in your youth, play different sports. Mm -hmm. um, and we still think that baseball and soccer align pretty pretty good. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, you maybe play a short season, like a summer league for uh, for baseball. I mean, Ajax is famous for their academy. Mm -hmm. And maybe they, they'd be interested in, you know, playing baseball as well in the summer to get their kids to play more sports and get just create better athletes. Right. That's something we, we thought about and maybe we'll look into. But... Um, it's going to be difficult to, because they're so focused on soccer. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, so do you think that that is like the best chance that you guys have t- is to go with that angle? Like this is going to help you make better soccer players. Who knows? Who knows? I mean, the, <laughs> our, our most famous soccer player, Johan Kev, he actually played baseball as well at, at Ajax. Wow. Before he, before he uh, turned professional in, uh, in soccer. Uh-huh. And he said he actually became a better uh, soccer player because of baseball. He was a catcher. And uh-huh. He always had to think forward. You know, he had to be three or four steps ahead. Yes. And, and that's what he was famous for in the field as well in soccer. Uh-huh. You know, just knowing where to where to go with the ball, who to pass it to, where right. to run. So uh, that's a pretty cool quote. And oh you know, yeah, that's something we'll definitely use uh, <laughs> if we ever go to the, the football teams. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I'd say, like, your question was, is that the, the, the main way to grow in the Netherlands? I, I would say right now we'd have to focus on different types of memberships. Like like I said, maybe not full season uh, leagues, but right. you know, more like summer ball, stuff like that, tournament style, baseball and soccer. Yeah. Right. So it's almost like re reimagining or recreating baseball in an entirely new way. Like, it really is. Yeah, like, like Baseball 5 is really just another version of the sport, completely different. Yeah. There's there's some overlaps. There's you know the basic rules like first base, second base, third base, home plate, right. you're out, uh, when the ball beats you there. But mm-hmm. it's completely different, and you have to reimagine because you you know you can't. That's like the definition of insanity, right? You yeah. Trying to do the same thing over and over again and expect different results. Yes. So now we're looking into you know different different ways to grow the sport. Right. Yeah, and I think that's that's definitely going to pay off. I think you're being very forward thinking uh, versus. A lot of people are kind of embodying that definition of insanity, you know, across the world. We're running into those issues as well because I think baseball is is really uh, such a conservative sport. Mm -hmm. People who play, there's like, no, this is baseball. We got to play nine innings. We got to do this. We got to do that. Yep. And to a certain extent, I get that. I mean, I wouldn't want to play seven innings at the highest level. Right. uh, I see the the World Federation doing for up until under 23 Mm -hmm. tournaments. They all play like up to seven innings now. Um, you know, you don't want ties in baseball. You don't yeah. want you know, certain certain things. But we're gonna have to change something because we you know, we're gonna lose the sport here in the Netherlands if we keep doing this. Right. Yeah, and you know, it's interesting because I'm I'm hearing a lot of similarities to some of the problems that y'all are facing and some of the problems we're facing here in America where the game was invented. Yeah. I mean, but I think that's that, that's just baseball. Yeah, I mean, that, that's an international thing. I, I guess if you call someone from Dominican, they they tell you the same thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, but it's also interesting because it is growing in certain parts of the world, especially Asia, Japan, Korea. Their league has been blowing up right now, um, and, yeah. and their fan atmosphere and engagement is completely different than you know a baseball stadium in America, where it's like, oh, Have you ever been? I've never been, but I have been dying to go. It's crazy, man. We were, uh, like I said, I was at the the World Baseball Classic. Uh-huh. We played the first round in Korea, uh-huh. and then the second round in uh, Japan. And I, and a few years before, I was in in Taiwan as well. Oh wow! So you hit yeah, that whole it's circuit. Just, <laughs> yeah, it's crazy, man. They they have songs for every hitter. Yeah, like a band in the stands and right. bring their horns and everything. <laughs> it's, it's like completely different from what you get in. Uh, in the states or in like our, our sports culture is pretty much the same especially in baseball as you guys mm-hmm. you'd have quiet guys and there's a hit you clap you stand up and yeah you hit a home run and you start shouting and stuff but they just keep going yeah like three or four hours long and when you get like <laughs> when you get home to the hotel after the games those songs are still going in your head <laughs> and you can't go to sleep for a few hours <laughs> and you know it's like in america I, I try to imagine if that would go over well. And I and as it stands, I don't think it would just because of that kind of the conservative Is approach to the game. Yeah. Um, but I think if it were kind of slowly introduced, at, especially to the younger generation and, and they were exposed to that in time, yeah, that's, that that's the way it changed. Right. Yeah. yeah. But if you look at if you look at the World Baseball Classic. The, the different styles of play and and also the different styles of fandom because in the Caribbean as well they're super uh, super into it like, yeah like passionate and shouting and dancing and everything right. and I think people enjoy it mm-hmm. I mean especially the last one when the U.S. won because you know you need that to be I mean if you want to get the U.S. fans in there you, you know USA has to win it yeah. <laughs> 
But um, yeah, I think the people really started enjoying it. Even like like the like the bad flips and uh, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. It's been I've I've been seeing less and less pitchers go crazy over it, and you know, so yes. there will be a Madison Bumgarner uh, rant every <laughs> once in a while. But you know, if you don't if you don't want to see it, don't give up a home run. That's exactly. Really in the, the 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 main deal right now. Exactly. Yeah. And and that clash, it's like. At some point, does one side win? And I think the momentum is going towards that uh, embracing of just like having more fun with the game, bat flips, whatever, uh, some trash talk. Uh, the MLB takes a lot of hits for not marketing their stars. Um, and if if we were to kind of go in that direction in America and, and kind of emulate some of what we're seeing from the Caribbean and from Korea, you know, it could reinvigorate national interest in the game. And I think mm -hmm. uh, perhaps that's a similar situation that the Netherlands is in right now. And I guess I'm kind of going off of that, like what's, what's the source of resistance in embracing the sport in the Netherlands? Like what are some of the, the objections from casual sports fans and why they just aren't interested in the game itself? And uh, I always say here in Europe, Western Europe, people like simple sports. You look at soccer, for instance, it's 22 guys, a ball, and two goals. Mm -hmm. and, and the weirdest thing there is offside. Otherwise, everyone knows the rules. It's yeah. super easy to learn. Uh, tennis, super easy. Field hockey, same as soccer. Um, maybe a little more rules, and but it's still simple. Right. Um, cycling, it's big here mm -hmm. in Europe. There's 160 guys, and only one guy wins. Yeah. <laughs> and they, they ride for, for 160 miles, and then we'll see who ends up winning. Yeah. But baseball and other American sports, uh, I guess there's there's so many rules. Like American football never really took off here. Right. That's, that's what we call it. Football it never really took off. Yeah. Uh, baseball is, is growing in some countries, but it'll never be as big here because of that. I think it's just people like for us, speed skating, like like NASCAR is just mm. going left, going left, going left. <laughs> yeah, that's that's huge here, but. I mean, there's the uh, we we need to educate the people, I guess, and that's difficult to do because oh, you yeah. need to, you need to reach them at a young age mm -hmm. at schools, but then to do that, you have to teach a simplified version. Right. Uh, so it's it uh, yeah, it's, it's just like a what you call it, a vicious circle. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that kind of seems to be the key, uh, you know, as I'm like processing this discussion is that if you if you can simplify even if it means altering some of the fundamental rules of the game to to at least get people on the field and mm -hmm. get them somewhat interested in a version of the game and then in over time they can be gradually still introduced. introduce them to yeah yeah and that's 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 okay if you're trying to get new members exactly uh, because they got to get invested into the game but to get new fans that's really difficult right and and my thing is like perhaps if if you know parents when their kids are getting involved and maybe they end up becoming good at baseball or maybe that turns the fan, the parents into fans but mm -hmm. who knows like is do we have hard evidence of that? But that's that's another issue we have because we well if you get new kids mm -hmm. to play the play the game whose parents never played you got to get a coach somehow somewhere right and if that's going to be someone who's never played the game themselves yeah. <laughs> what they're gonna teach you, <laughs> and if you if you don't get better at something, that's the way I always was. At least, like I want to get better, right? And if a coach can't help me get better, then I might lose interest and go do something else. So that's another issue. We gotta teach parents, but all, yeah, we we gotta teach them how to coach and, yeah. and give good practices. And and I was gonna actually discuss that a little bit. Is like, what is the what is the level of coaching? I'm sure there are some top level coaches in the Netherlands. Uh, and it, but I'm also curious about whether I mean, there's a huge gap between our top level coaches, which uh, most of them, they they work for us uh, to coach the national team mm -hmm. or the talent programs, and some of those guys are really like even few of those even work for major league organizations. Now. Oh wow! Uh, they either scout for them or they actually uh, you know they're, they're instructors for them, mm -hmm. and they fly into uh, the, for instance Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess uh, Bradenton is where their spring training facility is. Okay, yeah, yeah. And they actually they help out there, and they give uh, lectures at the Florida Baseball Summer uh, Summit, no, Florida Baseball Ranch Summit. Okay. 
uh, that's something cool to look into because we had like three or four Dutch guys who were teaching baseball uh-huh. uh, that way. And then, then uh, um, so we call it motoric learning. Mm-hmm. I think that's, that's the English term, uh, which is huge here for us. That's how we teach our, uh, we develop our talent, uh, talent in our program. Right. Uh, but then, you know, that's, that's top level then, and, and, and major league baseball organizations attend those, uh, those uh, summits. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. But then at a lower level, like I said, you're going to have coaches who never even played the game themselves. Mm-hmm. And even in our, in our league, it's, it's difficult to get coaches to, uh, invest so much time, like, you know, practice and then three games a week. And then, you know, you got to be there every time you may have kids or your own young family. Mm-hmm. You don't get paid too much. You still got to work beside it. Right. You know, so the, the top level guys, they get paid by us to either work full time or, or, or be the, the national team coaches. Yeah. But other than that, there's not a lot of money to be uh, to be made doing coaching baseball. And that. so it's. <laughs> and, and how many of those coaches are homegrown or are from the islands or are outsourced from maybe America? Um. Well, we've always had American coaches come in and, and teach our guys. Okay. We've had a few American coaches, like Davey Johnson, for instance, mm-hmm. who uh, he coached our national team for two or three years, I think. Mm-hmm. But we've had like, a lot. Of, we we actually won the World Cup in 2011, and uh, Rod Delmonico, mm-hmm. uh, famous college coach, he was our uh, national team coach. We wow. had Pat Murphy. I think he coached Arizona State. Okay. Sure, but yeah. he's like a big name in college Powerhouse, sports as well. Yeah. He coached us in 2000 at the Olympics when we finally were the first team to beat Cuba. Oh, it's wow. like a, a big, big breakthrough for us because in international baseball, we, you know, in Europe, we were big. But besides that, we never really had great achievements in uh, international baseball besides that. Mm-hmm. And then in Curacao, we have uh, Hansling Mullins, which is the, the guy who coaches our team uh, in, the, in the classic. Mm-hmm. He's now a bench coach at the New York Mets. Wow! And he leads their uh, their whole program when the when the guys are all back in Curacao in the winter. Okay. And there's other guys there. Eugene Kingsill, former big league player in Aruba. Mm-hmm. We, uh, for instance, Hall of Famer Bert Blylevin. He joins us as a pitching coach every time we have an international tournament. Mm-hmm. So these are guys that can actually actually teach our guys from the Netherlands as well, and the guys in Curacao. Right. And that's how we try to spread the the knowledge a little bit. The partnership between the Netherlands and the islands, when they come together, like you've been able to see that firsthand. Like what is that exchange like? Because the, I guess I can't imagine they share very similar backgrounds or upbringings. You know what I mean? No, no, they don't. But we, um, yeah, I mean, these guys have played together for so long, especially this generation of guys. They, 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 they've known each other for a long time. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot of Dutch guys in pro baseball as well. So they, they play each other there or against each other or, um, you know, they played on the, the national youth teams, uh, and, and we're trying to get more and more uh, guys from Curacao and Arupa in the youth teams as well. So mm-hmm. we keep keep continuing that you know, development that they, they they get to know each other, mm-hmm. um, and they've just become friends. I mean, it's the, it's the language of sports, I guess. You know, you, yeah. you play on a team together, you play well, and then and, and friendships start start to uh, develop. Right. Yeah, and. Do, do, I guess fans of, or just the people of, um, the Netherlands and Curacao, do they all see each other as one nation or is it more, uh, complex than that? Like, uh, man, I, I really wish, you know, we in Curacao just played for ourselves or I wish we in the Netherlands had our own thing. You have different groups. There's, there's always going to be people like, uh, in Curacao, we feel like you know we should we have so much talent here we should play by ourselves and right there, there's fans in the Netherlands who are like yeah we want our Dutch guys who play in our league on the national team and then we're like yeah okay. I think if we combine those with uh, the guys from Aruba we have the best chance of performing oh yeah you know, we, have, we get our professional guys in there and we, we just have a good chance of getting uh, more visibility for our national team for our sport in the Netherlands but also worldwide uh, better chance to get sponsorships uh it's just the way to go we feel like and it's it's also uh especially in times like these a good way to show how working together from you know different upbringings different colors you know how how you can get successful if you just respect each other work together exactly exactly yeah i find that fascinating 
Can you talk briefly about the uh, the Olympics in Japan? So we the Netherlands haven't qualified yet. There's supposed to be a competition. It got postponed. Um, what's what's that format going to look like, and how confident are you that you guys can uh, get that last bid? It's going to be really difficult. And right now, we don't know when it's going to be. Mm-hmm. Um, like I said it was supposed to be. Well, it should have just ended now. Mm-hmm. Uh, it should have been June first or fifth, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, but before we get to play that tournament, uh, the Americas still have uh, have a qualifier as well. Mm-hmm. So the the winner from that qualifier goes directly to the Olympics, mm-hmm. and then numbers two and three go into our tournament. So that'll be us, Chinese Taipei, China, Australia, I think, mm-hmm. and then the two like numbers two and three from the Americas. So okay. it's going to be really difficult. To, to qualify from that, yeah, so the winner winner takes all, right? Um, but yeah, we, as long as we, we're in it, we, we still have a chance. We want to make it. Yeah, and we were we were upset by the by Israel team. Oh, which had a lot of American guys who just got their passports like three weeks before the. <laughs> so it's, that's a tough one, tough bullet to buy through, I guess. Yeah, fill the swallows, what you call right, it. right. But yeah, you know it happened. We we had a chance to qualify there, but we lost to Israel. Mm-hmm. Uh, we won like four and one, or five and one in that tournament. Four and one. But, okay. Uh, yeah. Not enough. Wow. So we got to get you know, get, go for our second chance and yeah. make the most of it. That's rough. I mean, it's disappointing that there's only six teams uh, participating when there's a lot more competitive nations, you know, in yeah, baseball around sure. the world. I mean, there's going to be. A lot of disappointed fans that that team's not going to be there. Yeah, like for instance, people might not make it, and they've won like almost every every tournament so far. Right. There. But um, I mean, it's not the same Cuba anymore, but still. Right. Yeah. It's, it's weird, but that's that's a trend you see in the uh, the Olympics. The IOC is just looking for smaller events. I think baseball is difficult to plan for them. Mm-hmm. It's just like it's such a big tournament, all the sports together. And yeah. It's, Trip timelines and everything. Right. You know, baseball could again could go six hours for all you know. Yeah. <laughs> and the teams are big, and they gotta you know gotta uh, make sure they have a place to stay for all the guys, mm-hmm. and, and then softball as well. So yeah, that's very true. Guess, yeah. Hopefully we uh, we get back on the program in 2028 when it's in uh, in the U.S. But yeah. 2024 in Paris, there's not going to be any baseball or softball. Yeah, I know that's also really disappointing. Uh. No. So I guess my final question is, what would you say is the future uh, of baseball in the Netherlands uh, over the next five, maybe 10, even 20 years? Like, where, where do you see this game going? Uh, like I said, if we keep doing what we've been doing, we probably won't see any change. So mm-hmm. we, we got to figure out a different way to grow the, grow the game. Uh, now, uh, that's where Baseball 5, for instance, comes in, but also the, the live streaming uh, the the main league, like the, the major league here, and then hopefully we can we can uh, you know, stop the league as we say uh, in age group thirteen to sixteen, eighteen. Mm-hmm. That's where we see our most people, our most kids going out and leaving the sport. I see. We gotta st- you know stop that gap and then just keep going and, and getting the younger kids in there. And hopefully we can we can do that and start growing as a sport again. Absolutely. And, and I definitely see the game bouncing back in the future with some of the initiatives y'all have going on at the Federation. Uh, I'm just I'm really excited to see how Baseball 5 impacts the growth of the game going forward over there. And, and I hope the work y'all are doing starts getting more coverage, too, uh, just because it's it's such a unique and talented country. I, I think more people should be talking about what y'all have going on. Um, In any case, once again, Seb, I I just want to thank you so much for your time. And to everyone listening, I really appreciate your support. I hope you join me again next week. But until then, give Seb a follow on Twitter at SebVisser34. And tap that subscribe button to make sure you don't miss out on any future episodes. This has been Growing the Game. I'm Zach Mason, and I'll see you all next week.